Well, oftentimes tricks are used on YouTube math problems that often require some checking which isn't done, and I'm guilty of this as well. And one of those tricks is sometimes term by term either integration or differentiation. And today I thought we'd look at an example where term by term differentiation does not work. And this is from a short article in the Mathematical Gazette from 1959. And the function that we're looking at is defined as follows. So it's the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n squared natural log of one plus n squared x. So maybe we really wanna think of this as the limit of a sequence of functions. So perhaps the function f sub one would be the first term. So in other words, it's natural log of one plus x squared. And then f sub two would be the first two terms. So that would be the natural log of one plus x squared plus one quarter natural log of one plus four x squared. And then f sub three would likewise be, well, it's gonna be f sub two plus one over nine natural log of one plus nine x squared and so on and so forth. And so, like I said, the function that we're really looking at is the limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence of functions. Great, we've just written it as a sum, but like I just said, it's really thought of as the limit of the partial sums. So like I said before, our goal is to show that term by term differentiation does not work, but we're gonna show it doesn't work at a specific point that's kind of easy to work with. So let's look at the derivative of f at zero. And well, let's maybe not calculate it, but we'll kind of bound it below by some number. Okay, so let's get into it. So we'll take the derivative of f at zero using the limit definition of the derivative. So this will be the limit as x goes to zero of f of x minus f of zero over x minus zero. So this is perhaps not the limit definition of the derivative that you use in a calculus one class or something, but this would be the first limit definition of the derivative that you see in maybe like a beginning analysis class. So put more generally, f prime of a is equal to the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. And that can be changed to the standard limit definition by setting x equal to, let's see, a plus h. But now let's notice that f of zero is pretty clearly equal to zero because we get the sum of a bunch of copies of natural log of one and natural log of one is zero. So that means we can rewrite this as the limit as x goes to zero of one over x times this sum. So I'm just gonna bring that sum over. We have one over n squared natural log of one plus n squared x squared. So something like that. And now we're gonna start building an inequality. Like I said, we're gonna try to bound this below by something. So that means we've got to get an inequality in there at some point. So let's take any natural number n and notice if we start this sum at that capital N value, then we'll create something smaller as we're adding a bunch of non-negative numbers together. So this is bigger than or equal to the limit as n goes to, or as x goes to zero of one over x and then the sum as little n goes from capital N to infinity of one over n, n squared and then natural log of one plus n squared x squared. So like I said, that's just from starting the sum a little further out. And also, like I said, that's for any value capital N. But now we're gonna do a change of variables in our limit. And that change of variables will be to set x equal to one over n. But if x is equal to one over n and x is approaching zero here, then we would need capital N to approach, approach infinity. Okay, so this equality right here is, well, like I said, that substitution. So x is turning into one over capital N. So let's see what that looks like. We'll have now the limit as capital N goes to infinity 
and then we'll have capital N from this one over X term. And then the sum as little n goes from capital N up to infinity of one over little n squared. And then we have the natural log of one plus N over capital N quantity squared. So I put those two together. But now let's notice that inside of this sum, the values of lowercase n are bigger than or equal to the values of uppercase n. That's because, well, we're summing from capital N to infinity. So that means the quotient of lowercase n by capital N is always bigger than or equal to one, which means the quotient squared is bigger than or equal to one. But then that means if you add that to one, you'll get something that's bigger than or equal to two. But then since the natural log function is increasing, that means that when put inside the natural log, you get something bigger than or equal to the natural log of two. Okay, great. So that's good. We've simplified it a lot. We've got that natural log out of there. And well, look, we've got a constant now which we can bring out of the sum. So this is all bigger than or equal to, again, using that uh, argument over there, the limit as capital N goes to infinity of N times the natural log of two and then times the sum as N goes from capital N to infinity of one over N squared. Okay, so something like that. But now we'd like to work with this sum right here and we'll approximate that sum with an integral. And based on maybe, you could draw some pictures to convince yourself of this if you wanted to, but maybe I won't do that. You could see that this sum is in fact bigger than the integral that we're gonna draw. Okay, so this is bigger than or equal to the limit as capital N goes to infinity of capital N times the natural log of two times the integral from capital N to infinity of one over t squared dt. Okay, good. But now that integral is fairly straightforward to calculate. Notice the antiderivative is minus one over t. You evaluate that between t n and infinity. Obviously the infinite bound is a limit, but that'll give you zero. And then the lower bound will simply give you one over n. And since it's attached to the minus sign, it's a, in the end a plus sign, you know, the net positive. But that one over n, I'll cancel this n, meaning that all of this last step is equal to n over n, which is one times the natural log of two. Okay, so let's put a little bit of a summary of what we've just calculated right here, or what we've just shown. We've shown that the derivative of f at zero is bigger than or equal to the natural log of two, which itself is bigger than zero. Okay, so now let's move to try and calculate the derivative via term by term differentiation and see that we have a problem. Okay, so so far using the limit definition of the derivative, we've shown that the derivative of f at zero is bigger than or equal to the natural log of two, which in turn is bigger than zero. But now we're gonna like attempt to do this via term by term differentiation and see that we run into a problem. So let's look at f prime of x. So that'll be equal to the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n squared and then the derivative with respect to x of, well, the natural log of one plus x squared times n squared. Or I guess we're writing this as n squared times x squared. Okay, so let's calculate that derivative or those derivatives, I should say. So we've got a one over n squared here and then we've got to use the chain rule so that argument of natural log will go into the denominator. And then in turn, we're gonna multiply by the derivative of the argument of natural log. So that'll give us two n squared times x. But notice that these n squareds cancel and we end up with something like the sum as n goes from one to infinity of two x over one plus n squared x squared. And you can actually find the value of that, if you will, or sum that series up into a function. I think it looks like the cosecant or maybe the hyperbolic cotangent. I don't really recall 
at the moment. Maybe post in the comments if you know. But our goal is to see what this is at x equals zero. So let's see, if we set x equal to zero, well, every term there pretty clearly turns into zero because we've got that two times zero in the numerator. But look at this. So that means by term by term differentiation would imply that f prime of zero was zero. But term by term differentiation is not to be trusted you know, when compared to the limit definition of the derivative. So, well, that means that term by term differentiation here did not work. So maybe now let's look at the question of what went wrong. And what went wrong is really the, de the difference between something called pointwise convergence and uniform convergence. So let's quickly look at those definitions. Okay, so there we have the definition. So let's read them carefully. So we say that fn converges to f pointwise on a set A if for all x in A and epsilon bigger than zero, there is an n such that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, f sub n of x minus f sub x is less than epsilon. So the really important thing here is the ordering in all of these things being created. And what you might notice here is that we say for all x and a and epsilon bigger than zero, and that means that n could depend on epsilon and x. So let's write that here. So could depend on epsilon and x. So in other words, there might be a different n value for every x in that set, and that's pointwise convergence because the capital N value depends on what point you are at. Then next we say that f sub n converges to f uniformly on A if for every epsilon bigger than zero there is an n and n, such that if n is bigger than or equal to n, f sub n of x minus f sub x is less than epsilon for all x in A. So notice that that x in A is at the very, very end. That means that this capital N is independent of X. So that's the uniform convergence. So the convergence of F doesn't depend on what point you're at. Okay, so well, what's the deal here? Well, with uniform convergence, all of the nice characteristics of the sequence of functions are passed on to the limit, like continuity, or differentiability or integrability. So those are all passed on to the limit. With pointwise convergence, they may or may not be passed on to the limit. So notice that by you know, all of this setup with that knowledge, what we have here is a function that converges pointwise but not uniformly. We know that it does not converge uniformly because if it did, then these two ways of calculating the derivative would line up, but they don't. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.